to chew on this, where we practice theology as a community and the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine, and today we have a very special guest. My husband, Pastor Mike, jumped in and filled a night where we had extenuating circumstances where both Pastor Robin and myself were not able to make it. And he did it with about an hour's notice. So he gets mad props from not only his wife, but from everybody at Wednesday Night Church. This would be Wednesday, February 28th. And he is going to be talking about our our series, fitting his personal stories in with our series, Cunning, the spiritual battle from Genesis to Revelation. And it was interesting prepping him and helping him put together what he was going to say by me just encouraging him that he has enough experience and this would be really great discussion fodder for all of us of how he has walked through that as one, a lover of Jesus Christ, but then two, as the spiritual head here at Maranatha Church. I would like to invite you to relax and enjoy and just really enjoy my spouse as he shares his personal experiences. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be here, and, and I had about this much time to prepare. But she always tells me, Mike, says, it just, it's just in you. Just if, if, Give you a microphone and say, just go, it'll come out. Well, it's not quite like that, but I've been doing it a long time, and I really do like and enjoy what I do. Well, it makes a difference. Yep. Amen? Amen. To like what you do. Ben, Benjamin Franklin said, if you enjoy what you do, you won't work a day in your life. So he goes, our speaker last Sunday, he said that God will oftentimes use you in what you like to do. To realize that he's calling you to that and he wants you to be you. Um, I, I remember um, as I first came into this, the ministry thing and all that, and I seen people were in, <coughs> acting a certain way and behaving a certain way, and, which I don't want to describe because I'll be too sarcastic and make fun of them. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe that's what you got to do to be a pastor. You got to you do this, and you got to act like that, and you got to whatever. And I remember one day in my devotions, God said to me, Mike, who are you trying to be? I called you. I'm like, oh, I can do that <laughs> as long as I monitor it a little bit. <laughs> um, anyway, so the series that you guys are in is what? Cunning, the... Spiritual battle from Genesis to Revelation. <coughs> if this was the 80s, this title, this, this series would have been called Spiritual Warfare. You know, um, things evolve, we change the different uh, way we describe things. But if you think about it, this particular series really highlights the reality that Christianity is not a game. If there's a devil, then there's a a God. And we should take it very seriously, getting to know him. Who is he? What's he like? What does he believe? What did he say? Um, you know, I run into people when I witness to people and all that, and, and they oftentimes tell me, well, I believe in God. I go, you do? Fantastic. Tell me about him. Silence. You know, they can't tell me one thing about God. But they, but they kind of just esoterically believe in, well, I believe there's a God. And, and then I'll say to them every once in a while, again, if the relationship is, is right. Um, so you're saying you believe in God, which do you realize what a profound statement that is? If you believe that there's a God and you don't do everything you can do to try to get to know more about him, you're an idiot. Now, again, you got to say that in the right context with somebody, you know. But I really do. When you think about it, to say that you believe that there's a God, and then you just kind of go half half and stance through life, like, well, yeah, I believe there's a God. To say you believe in God and then not spend more time and energy to get to know him, that is really silly. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's, that's just crazy. So when somebody says they believe in God, I, I give you that little opening. Try it sometimes if, if you feel prompted by the Holy Spirit. If that would work. Just say, really? Tell me about them. And usually you'd be amazed at the silence. Because they just said that 
Because, yeah, they believe in God, or they say it just to kind of make you go away. Um, but it is an interesting thought to challenge them with, well, tell me about him. Because you get to know him. You know, get to know him. So it's pretty well. This, this idea that the, the spiritual battle. So what I'm going to do tonight is um, tell you just some experiences. I'm just going to talk about uh, some experiences I've had uh, both uh, with encounters with, you know, the devil, the enemy, our adversary, Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Dung Heap. Um, he goes by several names. The Father of Lies, the Angel of Light. Um, and then I'm going to give you, I'm just going to tell you some stories about things that God has done, like supernatural. Um, the spiritual battle. This going on all the time. It's going on all the time. It's going on in our culture right now, too. We just don't recognize it. We just don't recognize it. But there is a spiritual battle going on, good and evil. It's, it's happening all the time. In fact, I, really, that's one of the things I appreciate about our speaker Sunday, if you were here Sunday. Um, it, he had to go so fast, he only touched on a couple things, and he couldn't do it and flesh them all out. But he did a really good job in making you think and realize that, you know something, God's talking to us all the time. It's just that we're not listening. You know? Because I remember years ago, I was telling a a couple of some of these stories, just every once in a while, I'll say, you know, yeah, God told me this, and God said this. And uh, this one guy at our church, he said, you know, Pastor Mike, I wish God would talk to me. And I looked at him and I said, he does all the time. You're just not listening. That radically changed his life. He goes, I never thought about that. So he started listening. And a few weeks later, came back and said, you know, I believe God's talking to me. I'm like, I believe he is. Usually we're going through life with blinders on. We're just not paying attention. So anyway, um, the spiritual world. We are spiritual beings. Have you heard Orlean say something like this? We are spiritual beings having a temporary physical experience. And that physical experience is like a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. The Bible talks about we are like grass. It grows in the morning and fades and is thrown into the fire and burn. It's like, it's just a wink. And we're here. And then we're gone. And if you're over 60, you realize how fast it really goes. I mean, to think that Orlean has 13 grandkids. The oldest child of hers is 40. I say hers because sometimes they're not so good. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just being silly. Um, it's like, I can't believe our oldest is 40 years old. He's got four boys. It's like, how in the world did that happen? Holy cow. Anyway, it's crazy. Um, has she talked about the three kingdoms? Just out of curiosity, it's a little bit of a test time, but because if you think about it, in this world, there's basically three kingdoms, three sources, three power sources, if you will. If not, this would be a quick reminder, okay? Um, you know, in the scripture, it talks about um, uh, the, the power, the, uh, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the kingdom of heaven. The gates. That phrase, the gates, is making a reference to every city back in, you know, um, Egypt, uh, ancient times. The, the wise men, the, the elders, would sit around the gate. And that's where they would conduct business and make decisions, um, both to protect the city, things that are going on in the city, and that kind of a thing. It's like where the power structure was. Uh, it was right at the gate of the city. Um, and in a lot of ways, that is really symbolic for how things are still today. Okay, so it's not, I'm not going to talk along about, but just mention, uh, one of, obviously, the kingdoms is the kingdom of God. God's kingdom and all his power. Well, there's Satan in his kingdom and all his power. But there's one very, very important kingdom, and that's you. You are the ruler of you. You want to resist God? You can resist God because your kingdom is that strong because he gave us free will. God wants to move and do things and whatever else. Remember, I preached a sermon a while ago. God doesn't always get his way. It's really true. Amen? God does not always get his way. Do you always give God the way he wants? No. He doesn't. Um, And the same thing. The devil can't just come over and take over you. He has to tempt you. He has to beguile you. He has to lie to you. He has to cheat you. He has to try to convince you to surrender or give way at the gate that you guard 
with your yes or no. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a whole lesson in teaching, but just to kind of understand this idea of the three kingdoms, I think is like foundational when you understand you and I living in this world with the power of God and the power of Satan, our great adversary. Um, in James 4, uh, verse 7, tell you what, somebody turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Get your Bible. Somebody turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Somebody else turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Uh, somebody go ahead and turn to James chapter 4, verse 7. That's the first one I'm going to read. So if you get to James chapter 4, verse 7, or go ahead and read it nice and loud. Almost there. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourself to God. Be subject therefore unto God, but resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. You see right in there too, it's, it's be subject. In other words, be willing, be open to God, but resist the devil. That is really what we're up to, to resist the devil. Um, some of you, uh, again, if you're my age or older, you'll remember Sammy Davis, not Sammy Davis Jr., um, Flip Wilson. What was, it, what was that, one of, his, one of his little gigs, what was it? Remember the phrase? Oh, the devil made me do it. You know, he'd screw up, he'd do something wrong, and then he'd blame the devil. Oh, the devil made me do it. Anybody remember that? You remember that? Oh, the devil made me do it. Well, you know something? The devil can't make you do anything. Just like God can't make you do anything. It's your choice. The influences can be great. Our counselor, Dr. Dave, um, for years has said, you know, Mike, every one of us are capable of doing what we never imagined, what we swore would never happen. He said, every once in a while... All the stars line up. And even you and I are capable of doing those things which we said would never, ever happen. The right situations, the right... Well, who sets those things up to try to trip us up? The devil. Um, even the Apostle Paul said, Hey, but for the grace of God, there go I. He wasn't pointing the finger at people too often without realizing, you know something? God, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I have within me the capability to do the very same thing. And given the right set of circumstances, if everything just came in a row, I might find myself having fallen in the same whatever. Pride, ego, whatever situation, you know. Um, so if this idea of be submitted to God, open up, and then but resist the devil. It talks about this, this three kingdoms, like right there. Um, Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and live with him. You see, when you accepted Christ, that was an act of your will. Nobody forced you to. Now, granted, your wife at home might have been saying, Hey, you got to get to church. you got to give your life to the Lord. And it's like one, in one ear and out the other, and you know, or vice versa. I know men who are telling their wives, you need to get your life to... Guess what? Jesus says, I knock at the door. He doesn't pound on the door. He knocks at the door. It talks about Jesus being gentle. He would not extinguish a withering uh, wick. Uh, he will not break a bruised reed. He is a gentleman. He only goes where he's invited. Where the devil just about knocks the door down. You know, he can't, but he sure tries to. Um, there's this story, you've, you're all probably very familiar with it, if you're into animals at all. But a, a stray cat came by his front house, and, and the person at the house thought they thought it, and put a little milk. And then the next day, the cat was back meowing, meowing, meowing. So, well, he gave more milk. And after about a week, this homeowner was sick and tired of this damn cat. So the father says, I'm not going to feed that thing. Well, the cat sat out there for hours and hours and hours and just meow and meow and meow. And finally, give in. 
That's what you and I do often to our two-year-olds and to the devil. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Who's got it? Got it? Nice and loud, Mike. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is under their own the same kind of suffering. This idea of rebuke him. He's constantly going about looking for an opportunity, looking for you to be weak. Even at the wilderness temptation of Jesus, you know, at the end of Luke chapter 4 there, where it talks about, you know, the wilderness temptation, and it says, and the devil left him until another opportune time. That's for you and I. You know, we, we win victories in our spiritual battles, in our life. We get victories. We, we obeyed God. We trusted him in faith. And guess what? God brings about a miracle. He makes a way. He brings restoration. He does these things. But know this. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. You can't just go, oh, well, man, I got that, That's, and just go off on your... No. Your guard is always up. Be, be vigilant, be sober, be watchful. Your enemy, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Again, this idea of resisting. Um, great power. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. 10 through 13. Who's got it? I do. Nice and loud. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. You will be able to resist the enemy in the times of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. You know, it starts off, be strong in the Lord. You know, that is the key for all of us, to be strong, to be growing in the Lord. To be growing. You ever ask yourself the question, hey, am I growing spiritually? I remember having, you know, serving as a presbyter, I got into some, oftentimes some very um, disciplinary actions with pastors in, in just various situations. I remember one time I was having this, this t- conversation with this one pastor, and I said, you know, you really need to get better at what you do. And he looked at me because I was younger than him. He said, I've been doing this for 20 years. And I very kindly and politely said, Well, you know, you may have been doing it for 20 years, but you haven't been growing. I think you've been repeating your first year for 19 years. You did something, and now you've just kept it on repeat, and you just kept... You know, that's kind of how a lot of our lives are. Psalm, uh, Psalm, Psalm 42. Lord, my soul pants for you like the deer does the water brook. Wouldn't that be great if that was your life and my life? If we hungered after God in in just a greater way, it would be, amen? It really would be. Lord, help us. Um, In Mark chapter 5, reading this in the last several days in my devotions, and uh, the the demons, the demoniacs, um, the people possessed or harassed by demons it just kind of has jumped out and intrigued me. And then tonight it comes up that, you know, Mike, hey, can you, can you do Wednesday night? And I'm like, yeah, okay, that'd be cool. Because I've been just kind of thinking about the subject. Uh, verse 1, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Um, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him a man of the, out of the tombs with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had been bound, often bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone take him. Okay, this guy was demon-possessed. And you know something? Demons are stronger than men and women. When I say men, I mean mankind. Demons are very strong. They'd like to, at times, convince you they're stronger than God, but they're not. They're liars. But they are strong. 
They are incorporeal beings. They are created. They were fallen angels. Uh, They are superior in intellect and in strength and in wisdom than you and I. Um, Praise God for the grace of God that gives us the victory. Um, But can you imagine this? This dude, chains can't hold this guy down. I mean, he is demon-possessed. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have you to do with me, G- with you? What, do, must, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Uh, the demons know who Jesus is. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. I, there's some things in here I'm not going to park on very long, but they do ask, it does pose questions to me that I've never really thought through, and that was one of them. Why did the demons ask not to be sent out of the country? I don't, I don't understand that, but it's interesting. Um, and there's another interesting statement that I'm going to make a quick comment on in just a minute. Now a large herd of swine was feeding in the nearby mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. I just think that's interesting. He, he gave them permission. It's like, okay, you, you, yeah, you can, you can do that. Maybe it had a little bit with the fact that Jews didn't eat pigs. I don't know. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down to the steep place in the sea and drowned in the sea. Go to Mark chapter 8. There's a boy that's possessed in in Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. The one, two, three guys are going crazy. 8.14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Um, Is that really where I want to start? Uh, Jesus just got done feeding the, was it the 4,000 or the 5,000? And the Pharisees came and said, hey, we want to see a sign. And he says, why does this generation want to see a sign? He gets frustrated. So he left them, he got in a boat, and he departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread when they did not have And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, what I think is really interesting in human nature, and I know I'm bouncing all over the place, but just hang on, because I I always think this stuff's just interesting great. They reason among themselves, saying, Hey, it's because we have no bread. You know, they're thinking, Jesus is trying to make a point. He's, he's, he's really trying to jab at us. Hey, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, because, man, nobody, we, we forgot to bring lunch. Who was responsible to bring the food? And uh, he, he might be hungry. It's like, what, what is going on here? Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because we have no bread? Do you yet not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? He's speaking kind of harshly with them. Hey, don't you guys get it? I pause there for a moment because I say it. I, I think I hear Jesus saying it to me fairly often. Mike, it's wrong time. Don't, don't you get it? You, you've been going through the motions. And I, and I think you've heard me say many times if you're around Maranatha on Sunday mornings, Christianity is not a game. But so many times we treat it like it's a game. Oh, and we do it when we want to. And then we get serious about it. And, and then we're like, oh, what a, it's not a game. One day in a very horrible and or slash glorious way, we're all going to stand before God. The minute we die, we just stepped off into eternity. Forever. This is serious. There is nothing more serious than this. And yet, but we treat it so many times like, well, if I want to, you know, it says we should do this and that. Like, well, I don't really want to do that. Like as if we get to decide what... Are you with me? I think it's kind of, kind of interesting that he says, Hey, you guys, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, don't you hear? Do you not remember? This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And 
I hear him saying that to me sometimes. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of grains did you take up? And they said, seven. He said to them, how is it you do not understand? He's saying, don't, how is it that you of all people don't understand? It's not about the fact you didn't bring a lunch. I can make lunch. <laughs> I can make lunch. So many times I think we get caught up in what we think God is doing this. and I think we need to take two steps back and realize the big picture. What does God really want? He wants you to love him and enjoy him. And then spread that love that you have in that relationship everywhere you go. It's not like you have to intentionally... You just got to be there and let it radiate out of you. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness. Um, just just allow it to radiate out of you. So many times we muster up, I'm going to witness to somebody. And I'm just going to, and you work up all the courage. Oh my gosh, relax. I like what the angel said to the apostles in Acts chapter, I think it's 5. He says, hey, I want you to go out to the city square and just tell everybody about this new life. Just tell them about this new life. How has your life changed? We're going to get into that either this Sunday or next. Um, let's see, where are we? So then came to him from Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and they begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the head, led him out of town, and when he had spit in his eyes, <laughs> put his hands on him. Can you imagine that? Coming up for a healing service? <sighs> what? Um, okay, so I'm reading all this, and this is not where I wanted to go. You guys, it's not. It's, I think it's 914. Yep, thank you. I wrote down 814. It's 914. I'm, that was all good stuff, though, wasn't it? It's all good stuff. But let's go to 914. I'm just getting to this point where I'm going, oh, that's not it. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, um, Again, what happened was they're just coming from the Mount Transfiguration. Okay? So it's a great experience. They're coming down off the mountain, and what he sees is this chaotic gathering. Scribes and Pharisees discussing with his, his disciples. They're all there, and there's a thing. So when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when he saw, they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and started running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Hey, what are you talking to my disciples about? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who was a mute spirit, who has a mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, foams him at its mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to the disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him, and he said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? God, this is the second time we see Jesus being kind of frustrated. And again, you know, I just don't want him frustrated with me or you. I, do you think Jesus is ever frustrated with you? I think so too. And it's like, I want to live my life and say, Lord, I don't want to be frustrating to you. Um, I'm, I'm trying harder to live under first request obedience. I'm trying really hard. You know, when you're a young Christian, God talks to you and you're all excited. But as a few years go along, you, you realize that you don't got to earn your salvation. You kind of grow sloppy in your relationship or the tendency is there. You get kind of lazy and sloppy. Um, he asks you to do something and then you start thinking of excuses that why that couldn't have been God. Been there? Oh, that couldn't have been God. God would never ask that of me. You know? He might ask Rob, but he's not going to ask me. You know that, you know. Trying to get to that first time obedience. How much longer do I got to bear with you? Bring him to me. Then he brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. That messes with my theology, but that's another day. 
Often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can. I think that's an interesting response from our master. Think about how many times you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, if you could. What? What do you mean if I can? I can do anything. Is the, the hand, the right hand of the Lord shortened? Is anything too difficult for him? No, nothing. So this guy says, if you can, if I can. He actually repeats it. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, if you can, believe all things are possible to him who believes. Uh, immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. There's something that you and I can all relate to, huh? Lord, I believe. <laughs> Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come and running, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him. And you know, it was just the other day I noticed this last phrase. And enter him no more. You know, oftentimes, um, I, I know of situations where people have been delivered from demons only to have them come back because they didn't fill it. And Jesus told that parable. You know, if you cast demons out, if you don't fill it with something good and they see the place nice and clean and empty, they go, oh, let's go back there. Let's go back there. Um, I, I like that he commanded and don't, and don't dare come back. Um, my dad, uh, there's a guy named Joe, big guy. They call him because, you know, it's Pastor Doug, and he'd go out there. He was the leader of the charismatic prayer group at St. Peter's at the time. And so they go out to this house because this young girl's life's a mess. They go out there, start praying for her, and she starts manifesting demons. So her sister was there, too. And um, her sister, seeing her screaming out in pain and crying and carrying on, um, was concerned about her, so... My dad and Joe realized that they said, hey, listen, you just go sit over there and don't do anything. So they're here. They're casting demons out of her. Now, this girl that's 100 pounds soaking wet was picking up both of my dad and Joe, picking them off the ground. This woman was seriously demon-possessed. She had demons in her like you can't imagine. And halfway through the casting the demons out process, the, the sister over here just wrenches, screams out in pain, hits the floor, starts crawling around the floor. So they have to stop what they're doing. They got to go over here and attend to her. And what, what happened? What, what did you do? Well, I saw my sister in so much pain, so I asked to have some of it. Dumb, 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 dumb. You know, got to remember, you give permission. We give permission. The three kingdoms. So they cast the demon out of her, which is really easy because they hadn't lived there very long. Anyway, they go back, cast the demons out of this girl. Long story. All these stories I'm going to tell you from here on forward are going to be really abbreviated. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, and so when this girl got out and stuff the next day or day or two, told her mom what had happened and being extremely Catholic, um, you know, people are sometimes extremely assembly of God. They're more assembly of God than they are Christian. They're the same thing with Catholics and Lutherans. Some people are more Catholic than Christian. Some people are more Lutheran than Christian. You know what I'm talking about? I don't mean to be picking on them, but I just, that's, that's... so she brought, her mom brought the, the girl to the priest, and the priest said, oh, that really wasn't demons. You just need some counseling and whatever else. Tell you what, I saw the woman three months after that. She was worse than she ever was. All the demons were back. Everything else, lifestyle. I can't even describe her lifestyle to you. Unbelievable. Um, just horrible. My dad and I were praying for this one guy one time. Again, there's troubles. Called us up. Can you come out? So yeah, we went out there. We're praying for him. And all of a sudden, he starts just laughing. Laughing and mocking and jeering at us. And right away, it's like, oh, that's not him. There's a demon in there. Sure enough, so took over it, cast the demon out. And this particular demon had entered him because he was listening to self-help tapes. Now, listen carefully. I think there's, there's nothing wrong with listening to some good self-help tapes.
But whenever you are listening to anything that is telling you to go out of your mind, to let your mind go, to do this thing, be very careful. Because it's very possible it could be an open door. Um, people playing with the Ouija board, even if they're laughing and mocking it, and say, I want to play with the Ouija board. You know something? You're, in a sense, opening the door, giving permission. Um, I don't think we need to live in fear, but I think we need to live wisely, you know. Um, there's this one guy uh, coming to church for a while, and uh, he worked at Hazleton. And great guy, um, but he lost his job one time because he punched his boss. And he said, you know, he said, Pastor Doug, he said, I think I, think I have an anger issue. And we're like, we're like you think? Because um, there were several situations where this anger thing came up. And so I remember my dad and I praying for him. And at one point when we started to talk uh, to the demons that were in him, he just stiffened up. I mean, like rock. He was just rock hard. And then realizing, uh, my dad getting a sense that it was a spirit of anger, literally. He started rebuking the spirit of anger, left, and he became just as limp as a lily. I mean, and he was forever free after that, too. Just a wonderful, loving uh, guy. Um, there is um, a particular situation. I've told, like, this story in, in church before, too. I met this guy. I graduated from high school with him and ran into him, uh, and he said, hey, I got this girlfriend, you know, and stuff, and man, she's, she's kind of messed up. Can, can you talk to us? Now, what, it's really interesting. She met this girl. He was a truck driver. Met her at a truck stop. She was a lot lizard at the time. Is that rude to say? Is, do y'all know what I'm talking I mean, is, it's, not, it's not offensive? I just, when it just came out of my mouth, I thought, Mike, that might be perceived as pretty callous. Uh, it paints a picture. I mean, you get, yeah, exactly. So, so, <clears throat> so, he invites her in his truck, and uh, they do the deed. And when they're finished, they're both just sitting there in, in the back. And she says, you want to hear something that will change your life forever? He's like, sure. She tells him about Jesus. She prays for him to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. Okay, this is going to twist, with, mess with your mind a little bit. There's a new form of evangelism right there. Um, it's really strange. You, you and I have to realize, unlike the movies portray, you know, you flash a cross in front of uh, the vampire, and he, ah! Demons are not afraid of the Bible. They know it really well. The demons go to church. They come to church all the time on the backs of some of us. They come, they hang out, they know... It does not scare them. You know what scares demons? Is when we use the name of Jesus. When we are obedient, now they're in terror. Because now they know they're in trouble. When we are obedient to the word of God, they are in trouble. Otherwise, pff, nope. And she witnessed him. So anyway, so, so this is now I meet them. And, and I right away after meeting her and talking to her just a little bit, I, I just, I get a, man, little spidey senses are going crazy. I'm like, Man, this woman's got demons in her. And so I, 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 the first meeting was at Perkins, right in Forest Lake. And met them there for lunch. And we're sitting there, and I said, okay, let's pray. I'm going to pray. So I just started to pray. Boom. Her head hits the table. She's just poof, out. I get done. Amen. She perks right up. I go, okay. What I suspected is true. So I told him the next Sunday, hey, can you just stay after church? I'm going to... Man, I'd just like to pray for you. And really what I was doing is pl planning on kind of having some the board members, you know, with me. Um, it would be nice to have some people with me at the time at that I thought, you know. So, so after church, they come down to the front of the church. And so I'm praying. And again, you've got to remember, I'm, I'm suspecting there's a thing. So, you know, the Bible says watch and pray. Well, in these kind of situations, I watch and pray. <laughs> And I'm there, and I'm just bragging on the name of Jesus, expounding in the name of Jesus, because usually that stirs demons up, you know, in people. Nothing. She was tight-lipped, didn't give a clue. The demons in her had just settled down and realized, you know, if we just hang on here a little bit, we're going to be able to stay. So there was nothing. And I finished that prayer time, 
really feeling absolutely terribly inadequate, terribly, um, you know, what's wrong with me? Did I miss it? Or is there no power in me? To, you know, and, and just feeling terribly and horribly inadequate. Because I'm convinced this, this woman's demon-possessed. And later that week, it's 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. I'm in jeans, uh, in a, you know, just an A-shirt at the kitchen table with the kids. They had just went to bed. And I, and I hear their truck pull up. I look out the window and I go, yeah, it's, it's them. And right away in my, in my senses, I knew, oh, tonight's the night. It's like, oh boy, here's, it's going to happen. And I'm like, God, I'd love it to be in church with a lot of people. <laughs> I'm not feeling super spiritual at 10, 10.30 at night, you know. And I said to Orlean, I said, hey, just go in the kid's bedroom, just pray. I said, just be praying for a hedge of protection around the family and all that. They come in, sit down at the kitchen table, and just a, a couple of, you know, early greeting words and talking a little bit. I says, you know, well, let's pray. So I started praying. And she, her, the countenance on her face changed, and a growl, like from the pits of hell, just came out of her. And I was like, oh, my God. So, so I'm, I'm rebuking and casting these demons out. Um, and she, too, is one of those situations that shortly thereafter, they broke up and she just left. And I'm sure that the second situation of her life was worse than the first because she didn't follow Jesus. It's really funny. She knew the truth but didn't follow it. Friends, listen carefully. There's a lesson in that for you and I. She knew the truth but did not follow it. Should I say it again? She knew the truth, but didn't follow it. How many times have you and I said, well, I know I should do this, but. We all got big butts, and they oftentimes get in the way. Um, okay, what time is 7.30? We get down to 8? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you one more of these kind of stories. Um, I have several more. I mean, uh, there was... Uh, so I met a guy, this was years ago, Crown Auto, you'll remember, so Crown Auto, that's a few years ago in Forest Lake. I met Crown Auto, and I'm talking to this guy behind the counter, and he finds out I'm a minister, which surprises him, which does, happens often. So what do you do? Oh, if I tell you, you're not going to believe me. What do you, well, what do you do? Oh, I pastor. Really? I don't believe it. <laughs> happens all the time. I don't know why. Um, so, so I meet this guy, I have this little conversation. Literally, three months goes by. I get a phone call. I'm at home. I get a phone call. And this guy says, uh, hey, my name is such and such. Uh, I work at Crown Auto. Do you remember meeting me? We met about three months ago. You came in and whatever. And I said, yeah. I said, well, he said, well, I had a situation. And I couldn't think of anybody else to call but you. He said, is it okay that I called you? I said, oh, no, absolutely. No problem. I said, well, so what's the situation? He said, well, two weeks ago, we were planning this camping trip and these girls were going to come along and there's this one girl that was coming that I really wanted to sleep with. So I, and I'm thinking, why, why do you do this? Why would you think, he's, he told Satan, out of the blue, just said, Satan, if you uh, make it possible for me to sleep with that girl, I'll give you my soul. And he said, you're not going to believe it. He said, uh, that, that night, uh, the curtains in my room blew open. He says, and that weekend, I slept with her. I said, so why are you calling me? Because the last three nights, I haven't slept a wink. Every night, there's this demon comes in. In fact, while I'm talking to you, he's in the room right now. I said, what's he doing? He said, he's going to my closet, taking out clothes, bringing them to the middle of the room, and dropping them in the floor. I said, what color is he? He told me. I said, does he smell? Yeah, what does he smell like? Told me. And I said, so, so you're scared. You think he's here to collect. That's what I think. I said, well, let me tell you something. The devil's a liar. You don't owe your soul to him. You have to repent. Repent of what you did, of what you said. You need to renounce that and, and take that back. And ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Invite him into your life. Um, and then with that being said, done, you need to command that demon in the name of Jesus to leave. 
Anyway, so we spent quite a bit of time on the phone. Finally, he said, yeah. I, he said, is the demon gone now? He says, yeah, he left. I said, you need to get serious about following Jesus. You know, I never talked to him after that. I, do, I don't know what happened in his life. But, friends, I was talking to a person that was terrified. Was terrified. This demon was going in his closet, taking clothes out, and then going out and dropping them. And he was seeing this the whole time. Um, God, a story about Sue, about Thailand, an apartment building. Let's, let's switch that. Since we're talking about the topic of um, spiritual battles from Genesis to Revelation, really, I believe one of the things that Orlean is trying to highlight through this thing is this idea of the spiritual reality. We live, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. We are more spirit than we are physical because your spirit's going to live forever. Your spirit is stronger than your physical body. It gets even stronger if you work it out. Lifting weights. Are you with me? Um, when you, I've seen some incredible healings, you know, miracles in people's lives. Um, and, and read stories, and just like you have as well. Um, but I always think, as much as I love healing, I mean, my mom had this growth on her eye. She was a young Christian, didn't know any better, just believed the word for what it said. She had this big growth on her eye. It had grown. She had had surgery to remove it. If you looked at her eye from here to here, I mean, you'd see it, it was covering part of her iris from one corner all the way over, getting close to the pupil. This is this big, white, ugly thing. She had surgery to have it removed. She said, it was terribly uncomfortable. She, God, I didn't like it. It was, it was a horrible experience. Well, she had become a Christian, and it was, now it was, and it was growing back. And they were going to a prayer meeting with the Rev, Don Smith, from Redeeming Love. Some of you know him. You'd have to be been around a long time to remember that name. But anyway, so they were having a Bible study right here in Forest Lake, and they did every, I don't know, was it Thursday night or Friday night, whatever. And at the end of the service, uh, the pastor, Don uh, Smith, he says, anybody here need a healing? And right away, my, th- my mom thought, you know, my eye. I don't want to go through surgery again. No, th- th- that's kind of interesting. When she thought of that, was she just wishfully thinking that it would go away? Or did she really believe that God could do something about it? I don't know. But she said, yeah. So she went forward and he prayed for several people. She got home that night. She's in the, in the bathroom getting ready for bed, and she looked in the mirror, and she realized it's gone. I mean, it was gone. It was gone. She is going like this, just looking at all. I mean, but it was huge. You couldn't miss it. And she's like this. So the next two weeks, she's showing everybody, look at this. Now, by the end of this, her eye looked like hell because she's pulling around and showing everybody, and she's walking around telling everybody, hey, my eye is healed. And everybody's looking at her going, it looks pretty bad. You know, Oh, but, but, but it was gone. My brother, and my brother Tom, his leg, broken, down, you know, broken, fractured up here, down all the way to the ankle, then fractured off, bone marrow, or worry about leaking out. I've told this story before. And uh, they get prayed for. He's only been in a hip cast for three months. Have an x-ray. and Because um, they just go and have an x-ray every month. But my mom and dad, in the meantime... Being young Christians, they're reading the Bible. If anybody's sick, let them call the elders of the church, call them out, and pray for them, and the prayer of faith will save the sick out of James. So the, the uh, St. Peter's don't have elders. That's where they were going at the time. So they called up Grace Christian Missionary Alliance Church. Uh, pastor Dahl was the pastor. They called him out and said, hey, listen, uh, do you have any, do you have any uh, elders there? Uh, well, yeah, we have elders, and you know, that's kind of how we conduct ourselves. Um, well, the Bi- I was reading in the Bible here. It says have them, call up and have them come out and pray for them. So, do you do that? I mean, they just don't do that. But because he was asking, and he's quoting the Bible, I think Pastor Dahl felt a little obligated to send a, a team of elders out there to pray for my brother Tom. Well, yeah, we can, we can arrange that, you know. And I'm sure he was scrambling. Oh, man, we got a family out here who's going to believe God for something, and we got we got to meet this and make a long story short. They came out. They prayed for him, anointed him with oil. So my mom and dad did not have health insurance at the time. So this was a big deal. 
And they, that's why they couldn't do surgery and pin it. They just put a cast on it and said, you know, hip cast, and said, take it easy. And that's why you got to come in every month for an x-ray because we got to monitor. If bone marrow starts leaking out, now we got to do surgery, you know. So this was three months after the incident. Two weeks before this last, the, the next checkup is when the elders came out and prayed for him. So he goes in and has x-rays. And they, they come out and they say, Mrs. Hazeltine, we're, we're really sorry, but we're gonna, we need some more x-rays. Don't worry, we're not going to charge you for them. Uh, there's just some things that we, we're not sure about. We've got to check this out. Well, here's what happened. They took the first set of x-rays. It showed the bone was healed. They didn't believe it. So they went in and took another set of x-rays. Came back, same thing, bone is healed. So they had a conference from the doctors that were at the time. This was right here at Forest Lake. They had a conference and argued among themselves, what are we going to do? Hey, guys, this is, a, this is one of these pondering things. The x-ray shows that the leg is healed. So what they talked about was putting on a walking cast. And one of the doctors spoke up and says, guys, we are doctors of medicine. If we put a cast on that thing, we're doing it because of what our heads think, not because of what our eyes see. Our eyes see this thing is healed. They buzz the cast off. But, and then they argued and said, nobody goes from a hip cast that he was told he was going to be in for a year. He was going to be in a hip cast for a year and then a walking cast. And then you'll never use that. You'll be able to never ever use that leg the way it was intent, intended. You're never going to be, have a normal leg. That's what he was told. A year, then a walking cast, and your leg will never be the same. So that day, three months after that break, they buzzed the cast off, sent him home. It was healed. That summer, he set five school track records. But you know, as long as cool as these things are, I remember one time being in a meeting, and uh, the guy was asking for, if I don't talk here, they're not going to be able to hear this thing. Um, so if they... <laughs> I was in a meeting, and uh, I was about halfway back in the, in, the, in the seating area, and the guy was asking for, is there any... I'm touching buttons now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm touching something. It's still red, and the numbers are still clicking away, I think. Just keep going. Just trying to touch anything. Hi, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he asked, is there anybody here who needs healing? And this guy that was right in front of me stood up and said, yeah. And the guy says, so what's wrong? What do you need healing for? He said, I have three discs out in my back that are really painful. They're out in my back. And so, oh, okay, so let's pray. So the guy from the front, nobody touching him or anything, just praying for him. I heard three distinct and loud snap, snap, snap. And he goes, God just touched me. God just healed. I mean, I could tell you so many stories. Okay, so the greatest story, and I've said all that to one thing, glory, glory, bring glory to God. But secondly, to emphasize this one point. When you hear these things, uh, were you excited? Yeah? It's exciting to see what God does and can do and all. Isn't it exciting? It's like, wow. But you know what's even more exciting? It's salvation. Amen. Salvation. You think about your life. I think about my life. I was going this direction. I never even know you turn me around. We're all our own people. I remember people witnessing to me saying, you need to be born again. You need to have Jesus in your life. I was like, oh, okay. out of the grace of God he stays on you enough to convince you to at least slow down eventually stop and turn and say I'm willing to follow you only the Holy Spirit can bring that awareness that he is God amen, amen. he opens our eyes he penetrates the heart all of our, te- all of our teaching all of the, the whatever and it's hard to get through past your religious teaching and, and not just being Catholic, being Assembly of God, being Baptist. I know, again, I've said it earlier, some people are more Baptist than they are Christian. They're more, man, it, almost every funeral I do, I always emphasize Christianity is not about being Catholic or Lutheran or Baptist or Episcopal, E-free, Christian Missionary Alliance. You need to get that out of your head. Do, because you're that, that means you're a Christian? That means nothing. God says you're a Catholic, you're a Lutheran, you're a Baptist, you're Assembly of God. That's nice, but big deal. 
That's what God thinks. Big deal. We cherish all these things like, "Ah." Jesus said, Verily, verily, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, but God, I got my Catholic card right here. God, I got my Maranatha card. God's going to say, big deal. Have you been born again? Have you accepted Christ? Are you a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because when our life turns and comes to that point, that is the greatest and most exciting miracle. That is the greatest um, battle being won for God. A spiritual battle. If, you're talking, if we're talking about spiritual battle from Genesis to Revelation, that is, friends, the greatest spiritual battle that takes place in your life and mine. Amen? Amen. Great stuff. I mean, so I, I, I think of my salvation often. Um, in fact, uh, every once in a while, people ask me, you've been doing this for how many years? Long time. Well, how in the world are you able to maintain the enthusiasm and the passion and everything else that you have? My answer is always the same because it's really true. I have never forgot my salvation. I have never forgot it. He saved me. And I am eternally grateful. I mean, it is the greatest thing that ever happened. Orlean was number two. Um, I've never forgot. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. I am so excited and happy to be in a relationship with God that it brings joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. People wonder what I've been drinking. Because I'm, I'm, I'm happy. It's the greatest thing ever. Friends, guess what? Your salvation, there is a war for your soul going on. There was spiritual warfare going after your soul. If you want to talk about spiritual warfare, we could talk about that for a while. Um, I think about, um, and again, I, I believe most of you have heard my call into the ministry have you? If you've heard it, would you just raise your hand for a minute? If you've heard my, okay, so almost everybody here. I'll, I'll, I'll talk really quick because there's a couple here who haven't. Um, so I, I had submitted my life to God, got off drugs. Lo- I love God. I cannot describe to you how I got saved, saved, and I loved God. I had a great relationship with him. Um, I was witnessing to people in high school. I started a Bible study before school. I mean, my life had radically changed, and I just wanted to let people know about Jesus and live my life in such a way that people go, God, he's not like anybody I've ever met, you know, to be attractive, to make people curious and want what I have. Um, And so I was going to go to college, never planned on going to college, but I went with, so right after high school, I didn't take the SATs, I didn't do any of that stuff. I was going to go work with my dad. My dad was a stucco and plaster contractor. So from a little, just a little tyke, I was carrying buckets of sand, you know, to make cement. Uh, as I got a little older, and I'm carrying two buckets of sand and, you know, mixing mud. And I'm, you know, so my dad was a, a, plaster, a stucco and a plaster contractor, which plastering went out, sheetrock came in, so we started doing sheetrock. But um, so that's what I planned on doing, just going to work with my dad full time after high school was out. Well, I went with Orlean, uh, my girlfriend then, uh, to her cousin's graduation, which was being held kind of like in the midsummer. Because as soon as high school was over, I donated a month of my time to a Christian camp out in Colorado. Didn't get paid a dime. I mean, I donated, you know, over, just, just over a month of my time out there. So when I came back, we went to this graduation. And while at the graduation, her cousin Guy said, so, um, where are you going to school? Oh, I, I'm not. Oh, you should go to school. And you know something, seriously? Nobody in my family, on my mom's side, all my cousins, on my dad's side, all my cousins, Nobody ever went to college. I, it, it was never a thought that I would go to college. Why? I mean, I, it, it just wasn't even there. It wasn't ever talked about. wasn't ever pushed or encouraged. Not even a thought. But for the first time, because he said, well, you should go to school, the thought entered in. When you speak things into people, just know this. Sometimes... They could be used by God to do some tremendously powerful things. So when you speak, speak positive things into people's lives, hey, you know something? I believe in you. I love you. You can do great things. It, it, it has tremendous power. 
Anyway, so I went home, and again, ben, I can't describe to you how much I loved God more than anything and had a great relationship. So I came home, and I, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, do you think I should go to college? He goes, well, I don't know. And we've always had this idea that if you want to know the will of God, just keep moving, just go forward. He'll close doors or open doors. That was a phrase that we used a lot. He'll close doors and open doors. Well, let's just pursue it down and see how long the doors stay open. So we started praying about it, and I'm like, okay. So I only knew about one college, the one that this guy just graduated from. <laughs> it was Golden Valley Lutheran College. And I thought, you know, Lutherans have a, a good reputation. They can, get along, they can get along with, you know, a lot of different denominations and all that. I'm like, okay, Lutheran College, that'd be cool. So as I'm getting ready, I had to squeeze in an SAT test. I had to fill out, you know, FAFSA and all that. I had to do a whole bunch of stuff in the summertime. And, and fall was encroaching on us. It was getting close. And um, in fact, just out of miracles, that school was delayed by three weeks because of some building projects. Oh, kind of interesting. It was almost like it's waiting for somebody else to get there. Um, so as I'm getting closer and closer, I'm feeling all this stuff, and it's getting to be, I really need to decide, um, but there's just no way I can afford it. I mean, I just, I just need some money. And and they gave me a wrestling scholarship. They gave me a scholarship for being in the honor roll. They gave me, you know, all kinds of, but I'm, I just can't afford to go to college. So one night I'm going to bed, and for those of you who are hearing this for the second, third, or sixth time, I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm getting ready to go to bed, and I prayed. And I, th- I look back now, and I think, what was I thinking? I'm going to bed. It's 10 o'clock at night. I'm going to bed, but I prayed, Lord, if you want me to go to college, you know what I need. But I'm making my decision tomorrow morning. It's, I'm going to bed. What, what is God supposed to do? Hey, do you ever think about that? When you hear me tell the story, every time I think, I think about it now, I go, what was I thinking? Was God supposed to wake me up in the middle of the night? Well, that's exactly what happened. An hour later, and there's a wonderful time change, uh, I'm in bed, and my dad knocks on my door. He says, Mike, your Aunt Shirley's on the phone. She wants to talk to you. My Aunt Shirley lives in Seattle, Washington. And I'm like, bizarre. Who, what aunt ever calls? It doesn't happen. I'm like, Dad, are you sure? I'm thinking some kind of prank, some kind of, it's not my birthday, nothing. And so I'm thinking, weird. Are you sure? Yep. So I go down to the kitchen where the phone is. <laughs> I have things changed. So I go down to the kitchen. Hi, Aunt Shirley, this is Mike. What's going on? And she said, you know, your Uncle Jerry and I were just getting ready for bed, and we're praying, and all of a sudden the Lord just prompted us with this idea that we're supposed to give you some money to go to college. They had no idea that I was even thinking about it. Are you, are you planning on going to college? I am now. <laughs> you know? Hang up the phone. So, so God just opened the door. So I believe that it was his will for me to be at college. Um, I p- prayed, Lord, give me some good Christian roommates. Man, I, I think it would be a great time to have some Christian roommates that we could pray together and, and just strategize and evangelize together and just be on the same. I got three heathen. And that year, they let freshmen, because they were short of campus, they let freshmen live off campus. I was a mile and a half from the school in an apartment. Okay, so I'm, I am 17 years old, starting college. I'm 17 years old. I was working 40 hours a week, living in an apartment. I would work all day, go to school all day. Come, or, I mean, I'd go to school all day, then I'd go to work. I'd come home at 11.30 at night. There'd be a full-blown party going on in my apartment. People in my bed. I mean, it was crazy. I, I, I got some witnessing stories to tell you, but not now. So while I'm in school there, um, I'm taking way longer than I thought I was going to. I guess I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> it, it, it's a great story, and I, I, and I love to tell the story. It reminds me, too, just of God's goodness and the idea that there is a spiritual battle always taking place. Are we listening? What? What is God capable of? So I, um, I'm there halfway through the school year about, and, and I feel like I'm missing something. Now I'm having, again, I cannot describe to you enough how much I loved God. I had my devotions. I really, I love God. I love to share with him. In fact, I had some of the professors at this Christian college making fun of me because I'm witnessing and sharing the Lord with, not being out of place or anything. It's in our class. We can free and talk. And I'm witnessing and talking with my fellow person over here on the slate, you know. And... Um, 
the teacher overhears me. He walks up and he says, you know, Mike, he says, you sound like one of those TV evangelists. He says, I suppose you go on the street and you tell this to people too, don't you? I looked at him and I said, yeah, I do. Um, the head of the, the, the Greek professor, the head of the pastoral study department, um, he was a prisoner of war uh, and uh, he was a Lutheran minister. His fingers were all crushed and, and deformed from the butt of a German gun. But he used to make fun of fundamentalists, people that speak in tongues, like you and I. Um, and he knew I was, you know, a Pentecostal. And just by the way I talked, and we were talking to him and stuff, and he was just intrigued, but he'd make fun of the Pentecostals and all that. And, and he got to the place where he could tell that I was maybe a little bit agitated, just I didn't think it was fair and all that. So he asked me, he said, Mike, he says, tell you what, um, we're probably overdue for a conversation. He said, why don't you meet me in my office next Thursday? I said, okay. Now I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say to this guy? This guy is a brainiac, smart. Um, he, his typewriter is in Greek. He's written Greek books, textbooks, that get used at Yale and Princeton. He's been offered jobs in these places, but he's des desired and preferred to stay in this little college right here in Minnesota, Golden Valley, um, to teach. And so the guy, I mean, whatever. And I remember getting ready to go to that meeting. I just prayed one thing. I said, Lord, I know I can't do any kind of proper apologetics with this guy. I'm not going to convince him. I said, so Father, I ask just one thing. Would you let him know that you are with me? That's all I want. And it's like, okay. So I, I'll never forget the day in the meeting. I don't usually tell this story, part of the story, but I, I went down to his office. He had a narrow little office, books on both sides. We get down to the front, we're sitting there. We start to talk, and he asked me a question, so I answer it, and I tell him my story. And he doesn't respond at all. There's all of a sudden... The presence of God just flooded that room, and he was speechless. He had nothing to say. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he knows I'm with you. And I was just happy. That's all I wanted. He, when God said, he knows I'm with you. It was like, ah. Oh. Anyway, we ended our conversation. He never mistreated me a day after that uh, for the rest of, of school. Uh, instead, he had more of a, a respect. It's like, God, there's a young man that, hmm, it was just interesting. Um, anyway, so halfway through the school year, I'm, I'm like praying because, so I went in this chapel area because things were going well, but I felt like, I just, I felt like a fish out of water. I just felt like something wasn't jiving correctly. So I go in this, they have this chapel, it's about 12 feet in diameter with a circuit, you know, stained glass all around it and you went in the door and inside they had a kneeler. You know, those Lutheran kneeler kind of things where you kneel on it and get a little rail here. So I'm in there, and, and I pray. I said, God, you know, everything's going well. Again, I had a great relationship with God. I could talk to him like father, dad. I mean, in a real sense. I said, Father, uh, everything's going well, but I, I feel like I'm missing something. I've never asked you, what do you want me to do? And I heard God say, I want you to preach the word. Scared the living jeepers out of me. I got up and left. The next day, that experience was so real. I'm telling you the truth. This is exactly what I said. I went to the doors of that little room. I looked around and nobody was there. I went in. I knelt down in the same place I was yesterday. And I said, Father, forgive me for walking out on you yesterday. Because it was really rude. I just got the left. I was scared. I said, Father, forgive me for walking out on you yesterday. But this is me, Mike Hasseltine. What do you want me to do? And again, I heard him say, I want you to preach the word. And I started giving him all these excuses. Well, God's raised Catholic. I don't know what a preacher does. Um, nobody likes those guys. They don't make any money. I can't talk in front of people. And, and so I'm giving you all these excuses, and I sensed God laugh. He laughed, and he said, others have tried to get out of it and have failed, and so will you. Now, I didn't think that was very nice. <laughs> I didn't. I, that just doesn't seem right. Um, when I told him I can't talk in front of people, he says, don't worry about it. I'll speak through you. I said, if they don't make any money, he says, I will take care of you. I mean, every, every excuse I gave him 
You know, because I said, nobody likes those guys. Non-Christians don't for obvious reasons. I've learned that when I do weddings, I need to leave so they can feel better. <laughs> Are you with me? So they can start partying. You know, so they're anxious for the preacher to leave, you know. Um, so non-Christians don't like him because he's this moralist, makes them feel guilty and all that. Um, and, and, then not, and Christians don't like him either. Can you believe what he said? Can you believe what he said? Can you believe what he's wearing? Can you believe? Pff, he's so arrogant. What do you think? He preaches way too long. Oh, God, he doesn't preach long enough. You know, he talks about himself too much. God, I wish he talked about himself more. I mean, you can't please Christians no matter what. It doesn't matter. So I said, nobody likes those guys. I left feeling really, really discouraged. I mean, I was just really discouraged. Um, I said, and the next day in my dorm room, in my devotions, I said, Father, if that was really you, as if I had any doubt, I was just really trying to get rid of God. If that was really you, do this, this, and this. I can't remember what the three things were today, but those three things happened. And now I was madder than ever. I quit praying for the next three months. I quit praying. I quit witnessing. I didn't tell. We, I never talked about anything about Christianity, about God. I was so just being a spoiled brat stomping my feet out saying, I'm not going to play with you anymore. Um, but after that, because I had so loved God, I just was so empty and I was so missing the relationship with my father that I was just, uh, I got, we got to get this thing fixed. So that morning, I said to, to God, I said, Father, today, let me talking to somebody, have them bring up something to do with church work or Christianity and I'll believe you want me to preach. So after the chapel service, um, we're on the way out. There's an older student. Her name was Linda. And she sees me. She goes, Mike, you got a free hour next hour? I said, I do. She said, I need to talk to somebody. Can I talk to you? I said, sure. So we went down to the library. And, you know, these elongated, you know, library type tables were sitting there. We end our conversation word for word. We end our conversation. She sighs. She goes, oh, you're going to make a great pastor. <laughs> I mean, out of the, where in the world was she thinking? She didn't know anything. And I'm just, and now I was more mad at God. Fast forward, summer comes, there's a tent meeting being advertised. I go to the tent meeting, and I'm in the tent meeting, and um, I'm sitting, because I came a little late. I sat on, it was the middle aisle. I sat on the right-hand side, third row back, third chair in. I'm sitting there. The preacher is up preaching. His name is Dick Hendren. Didn't know me, didn't know my family, didn't know, just a traveling an evangelist. In the tent, he is preaching up a storm, and all of a sudden, that same voice that spoke to me in the chapel spoke to me again. It said very clearly, Mike, tonight's the night. Ask anything you want. Well, more than anything, I want God off my back on this whole preaching thing. And I thought, and I was kind of a cocky little snot. I said, okay, you started it. You said ask anything. If you really want me to preach, if, if you really want me to preach, you tell him. A minute and a half after that guy's preaching, after I breathe that up to God, he's in the middle of the story. He walks by, he stops. He points right at me, word for word. He goes, young man, you've been called to preach, and you've been doubting it. It wasn't a question. <laughs> you've been called to preach, and you've been doubting it. And I remember, I remember in that moment, I surrendered everything. I said, God, I'm not sure if I'll make a good one or a bad one, but I'll do my best. I remember I just surrendered. And, and I didn't feel like I had to perform. I just said, I'll do my best. And, and all of a sudden, God said, Mike, I know you, you, this is important to you, and this, Mike, I'm going to take care of you. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. I am now old. I look back at something that happened when I was 18 years old. I am now 64, and I can agree with the psalmist who says, I have yet to see the Lord's children forsaken. God has been faithful to everything he said he would do back then. I give testimony to that. I, and it's just amazing to now be as old as I am, Looking back, and God was faithful to his promise. He really was. It was just incredible. I'm overwhelmed uh, when I think about it today. Now, again, now that I'm old, I have, um, I have a lot more views in the rear view mirror than I do the windshield. You know, I look back and I just think about the goodness of God. The goodness of God. Two weeks after that, my wife and I, oh, so anyway, he says, and then, and then his eyes get real big and he startles back. And, and I said, are you okay? And you got to remember, there's 100 people in this tent. Les and Aggie Gimmel were in that tent meeting, and they remember it. Um, I said, are you okay? And he said, he, he, he was like, eyes really big, and he was just standing there. He goes, there's an angel standing right behind you. He was spooked. 
kind of shut down for a while. And anyway, life went on from there. You guys, we got to go. Is there any questions? <laughs> you know, two weeks after that, we were in a meeting. My wife and I were sitting uh, like she was here. I was here. There was a center aisle. And the guy was coming up the side. We were sitting in the very front on this side of the aisle. There's another section of chairs. This evangelist, again, doesn't know me, doesn't know my family or anything. He comes walking up. And all of a sudden, he walks past me. And all of a sudden, he stops. Like right in front of Orlean. He stops and he turns. And he goes, young man, you've been called to preach and you've been done it. <laughs> and then he began to prophesy, hey, this is what you're going to see in your ministry. You're going to see this, you're going to see this, you're going to see this. My dad, I said at St. Peter's Catholic Church, was the charismatic prayer group leader for years. They invited a, 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 charis, a charismatic priest from Steubenville, Ohio. They got a pretty cool Christian college out there, Catholic college. Um, <laughs> He was the guest speaker. And you know when these meetings are done, real often they invite people forward. Hey, if you want prayer, come up and he'll pray for you. So the priest is there, and I'm like, hey, I'll tell you to take prayer. So I'm standing in line, and he's praying for people. And they're telling him, hey, I just found out I need a new knee. I have cancer. I have whatever he's praying for people. So he's coming down, and he's praying for people. And he gets to me. He's just getting ready to say, because sometimes people don't really say anything. They just want him to pray for him. So he prays a generic prayer. So he's praying. All of a sudden he gets to me, and he stops. He's just getting ready to lay his hand on my forehead and pray for me. And he stops. Almost like as if somebody's talking to him. He stops, he puts his hand down, and he goes, Young man, he said, this is going to seem really strange to you. But the Holy Spirit wants me to anoint your lips. Is it okay if I anoint your lips? Now, I already have surrendered. Say, God, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm not sure what that means or what he does. I said, absolutely. Anoint my lips. Okay, now you can go. So any questions? <laughs> Hey, you know something? You guys, there is a spiritual battle going on every day in your life. And can I give you my definition of spiritual warfare? It's waking up every day choosing to serve God. Amen. That's spiritual warfare. You know, casting demons out and stuff like that, that's easy. You know, and you enjoy hearing some of those stories. And you're like, kind of like, wow, and all that. But you know something? You know what's a bigger wow? Is when you and I, every day, wake up and we make the decision, God, I'm going to choose to follow you. That is spiritual warfare. Amen. Amen? Okay, you're dismissed. Thank you, honey, for jumping in and helping us here with Wednesday Night Church. I do have a question for everyone that is listening today. What is it like to obey God? Have you ever thought about that as being a huge part of spiritual battle, quote-unquote? After listening to my husband share, that is something we all should be encouraged with. Obeying what God asks of me, obeying what God calls me to do, actually wanting to listen and hear what he has to say. Because that is one of the number one things we can do to be proactively doing the spiritual battle. It doesn't seem like a lot or seem related at times, but it really is the number one thing we can do. We love him, so we listen to him. Thank you so much for listening in on this week's episode on Chew on This. We'd love to invite you to join the whole Wednesday night church to enjoy this discussion live at our Forest Lake campus at 6.30 p.m. each and every Wednesday night. <laughs> and sometimes you'll get a surprise speaker. <laughs> if you'd like to check out this week's resources, there won't be any. So you're not going to get any document, but you will get the podcast. And all you need to do is go to realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. Also, once you're there, you're going to find a great archive to explore. A parting thought. As we're all learning to put missional living into practice, let's remember its simplicity. Today, wherever we find ourselves, let us love God and love people. See you for the next two on this episode. <laughs>